We will continue immediately with our last speaker of this uh, conference and um, he will talk to us uh, again on uh, new visualization tools. Greg Prickman is the Eric Weinman Librarian and Director of Collections at the Folger Shakespeare Library, where he is responsible for managing all aspects of the library collections, including curation and acquisitions, public and technical services, conservation and digitizing. Um, he will talk to us um, on the Atlas of Early Printing, an online resource built with GIS tools. And I think after having listened to Alex, we are extremely curious on what you can tell us on the Atlas of Printing. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you to Christina and the organizers of this conference for the invitation to be here with you today. I'm going to begin in January 1940 when Frederick R. Goff replied to a query regarding book distribution. He wrote, if on the other hand you mean distribution in the 15th century, I am unable to help you. Little is known about the book trade during the century and to attempt a generalization is hazardous. At the time, Goff was assistant to Margaret Bingham Stilwell as she compiled the massive bibliography Incunabula in American Libraries, A Second Census, which was then just on the verge of publication. It is perhaps fitting to revisit Goff during this week when our knowledge of the book trade of the 15th century has increased substantially. The tools that have enabled that knowledge have been built in part on the foundation laid by Stilwell and Goff. In my case, the tool I have built upon their work involves mapping data. But what is the data and where is it from? I hope this paper will provide a suitable bookend to the conference by examining some of the early forms of the data that we have this week witnessed being expanded into dynamic new forms. In 2006, I began work on a project I called the Atlas of Early Printing, which began as an attempt to bring traditional mapping of 15th century printing into a digital format. The spread of printing is one of the most frequently depicted aspects of the era to be shown with maps. And the Atlas was designed to animate mapping that had previously been static. The first version of the Atlas went online in 2008 and fulfilled its purpose to introduce the basic concepts underlying the early development of printing to a non-scholarly audience. A second version of the Atlas was released in 2013. This version added a layer depicting the development of printing using data extracted from ISTC. This layer was named Output by Location, which placed a circle on the map corresponding to the number of editions printed in that location in the year or range of years selected. By using the timeline slider and the mapped data points, the map became a mechanism to search the ISTC visually and geographically. <clears throat> it is now time for another complete rebuild of the site. And once again, this process brings the opportunity to expand the site's content. New layers will include ecclesiastical borders and the locations of bishoprics. Perhaps the most uh, significant addition is a depiction of typography drawn from data contributed by Oliver Dunza at the Gesamtkatalog der Vegan Drucke. Oliver has created a digital version of Heibler's Type and Repertorium der Vegan Drucke, which, when mapped, depicts the spread of Gothic, Roman, and other 15th century typefaces. Additional work with this data will allow for the individual M types table to be dynamically followed on the map as the types change owners and locations of use. The map that is currently on display in the exhibition uh, over at the Carrere, showing the present day locations of incunables around the world will also be available in the new Atlas, expanding once again the site's functionality as a visual search engine for ISTC data. My goal for the Atlas as it enters its second decade of development is for it to become a more open, expandable, even experimental site, one that is responsive to user input and capable of being modified to correct errors and add new information at a greatly increased rate. I am eager for the site to interact more dynamically with the ISTC and GW and May in real time, which suggests an aspect of the Atlas's construction that is fundamental to how it can be used and understood. 
As data is extracted from the ISTC or from any other database, it is placed on a map which creates a visualization of the topic. In fact, the visualization is more specific and I think more interesting. It is of the database itself. If the points on the map depict additions, it is only those surviving additions that have been described in the ISTC, a nuance that is often lost in the presentation of the design. The ISTC itself is a dynamic set of data, and despite the high degree of comprehensiveness it can claim today, the database is an assembly of descriptions that are both newly created as well as migrated from previous versions and formats. The more that I work with the ISTC, both as the developer of the Atlas and as an editor in May, the more the provenance of its data is of interest. As we've already heard this morning, uh, the first version of the ISTC, uh, one of the first sets of data to, to be input into the ISTC was Goff's Incunabula in American Libraries, a third census. The short title format was particularly suited to the database structures that were available at the time. The ISTC depends not just on Goff, but also on the work of Margaret Bingham Stilwell, whose Incunabula in American Libraries, the second census, published in 1940, created the descriptive format that was then perpetuated by Goff. As noted in the introduction to a recent volume titled Historicizing Big Data, contingent decisions, the adoption of particular tools or techniques at one point in time, have often strongly constrained subsequent developments. There is a material history to these decisions that provide a glimpse at the constraints that informed the final product. For Stilwell, those traces reside in her personal papers held today at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Stilwell lived and worked in Providence for her entire professional career as the librarian at the Anne Mary Brown Memorial. Stilwell's correspondence reveals how early decisions regarding entries for the census were informed by two separate influences. One came from the author of the first census, George Parker Winship. The second was the work of the Gesamt Catalog der Wiegendrücke, which had just established itself as the leading international project to describe the printed output of the 15th century. The constraints of her time influenced these decisions as well, as the world transformed around her during the 16 years she was actively engaged with the project. At the beginning, American-German cooperation on describing and identifying incunabula held the promise of a rapid transformation of knowledge. By the end, in 1940, the world was at war. It was Stilwell's suggestion to take over the revisions of the first census, and Winship responded in December 1924 with support and suggestions. He refers to the bulk of the material, the boxes of cards from which the manuscript for printing was compiled. He handed these over to Stilwell and recommends she start a new file on cards or slips to be kept in covers for all data that comes to you. As plans progressed, he continued to consider the decisions Stilwell would face. The immediate census question, I think, is detailed form of entry, the most information that is not to be had elsewhere in the most compact form. Stilwell considers these questions in the context of the biggest decision yet to be made at the time, which was the choice of printer and publisher. There, were significant, there was significant consideration of the costs to print such a large book, which affected the choices made for entries. From the beginning of work on the second census, the Gesamt catalog was a presence in forming activities. The early output of the GW provided guidance and also caused Stilwell and Winship to differentiate their project in the eyes of their colleagues, who often saw two large-scale bibliographic undertakings proceeding on parallel lines. In 1926, over a year after beginning the project, Stilwell wrote to Winship with her rationale for why the second census would not threaten to make the GW incomplete, with her primary reason being the GW is a catalog of books, not a census of copies. The goals of the projects were completely distinct, but the questions about potential overlap informed Stilwell's decision making in the planning stages. Stilwell already had a significant relationship via correspondence with the editors of the GW, she served as an American contact for providing the commission with data on American copies, and this work continued even as she became more deeply involved with the census. 
Stillwell's diary from July 7, 1931 records, the last of the bees from census files copied and forwarded to the Gazant catalog for the forthcoming volume five. She was particularly concerned to follow the GW's lead in terms of data formatting to ensure com compatibility. In 1932, she traveled to Germany to visit the headquarters of the GW at the State Library in Berlin. Her journal records her aims and her fears. I hope the seizure of the government threatened by the Hitler party may not take place before I have had opportunity to secure in Berlin the 15th century author entry forms from Gesamt catalog headquarters. She was able to complete the trip and obtain what she needed, but only a few years later, correspondence with the GW ceased. Stillwell utilized a variety of material forms to collect her data. A form letter was circulated alongside an accompanying campaign of notices placed in scholarly and literary publications. Several variations appeared throughout the life cycle of the project. A follow-up form, such as this reply to Kurt Bueller, gathered additional information where needed. The heart of the effort lay with the index cards. Unfortunately, I have not yet been able to determine if the index cards as a whole have survived. What we have now are those cards that crept into other portions of her papers and were saved. These do at least demonstrate the form that data collection took. What we now recognize as a short title format emerges from the brief entries contained on the cards. Stillwell also employed a wide variety of lists and charts to track the constant flow of information arriving in Providence. The second census was published in 1940 and it was not long after that, uh, that, and it was not long after that efforts to continue compiling locations of copies began. Stillwell revised the last request form to continue data collection. Frederick Goff eventually undertook the third census published in 1964. The few changes made to Stillwell's system included a new numbering sequence, which became a standard reference and provided the model for numbering within the ISTC. Goff and Stillwell enjoyed a warm correspondence through the years. He was always F. Richmond to her, and he would send postcards during his travels. One of these came from London in 1980 and reported on a new project Goff had witnessed. It was interesting to see Census 3 as a computer printout so far through L. It has possibilities for Census 4. Lottie Halinga inquired after you. Thus, two women are linked through Goff, one who created structures of description that proved solid enough to serve as a model for another who began its transfer to electronic form. A project such as the Atlas of Early Printing is designed to provide an easy to understand visual interpretation of a complex subject. But rather than existing as a site that presents a highly selected curated view of a topic, it can evolve to accommodate a diversity of views from multiple sources of data. The ability to overlay and, inter and interact with these different data sets allows geography to be the unifying visual factor between disparate groups of data. A more robust ex exploration of the development of the Gazamp catalog structures and how the commission and Stillwell collaborated is still to come and will illuminate the thought underlying the systems that we continue to develop today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, for taking us back into the very, very beginnings of a fascinating project. And I think we have covered a huge time scale today, bridging from the beginnings until a vision uh, to the future developments. May I ask whether there are some questions to our speakers, those still sitting here? I do fully understand that after three days of intense labor, you feel a bit exhausted. So you leave the floor to me to say um, that even with these last presentations, we can see how much we build on people, on developments, on material resources. And that this is a huge and living network which is there to serve research to trigger new questions 
and to allow us to deepen our knowledge on the cultural heritage issue in a very, very large sense. Um, I take the opportunity to thank the organizers of these wonderful three days as part as of the audience to which I did belong during two and a half days. I think you made for us a important meeting point on the history of book trade and of incunabula studies. And we, you did it in a wonderful, hospitable manner and in the most appropriate location we could ever conceive. So please applaud all of us and thank our hosts, especially Christina Dondi. special word of thanks is due, I think, to all those who are beyond the scenes and uh, uh, behind the curtain. Um, and I think uh, I would be very, very happy to thank for our audience, the translators, and all your helpful stuff providing us with catalogues, with guidance, with um, papers of all kind. These people are sometimes forgotten, but no conference would, would live without them. So please thank them with me. Thank you.